Welcome to New Scientist TV. This month we take a look at an invention that could let you turn out products in your own home. We also see how gazing at a computer screen can have a powerful effect. But first we take a look at simulated athletes that behave almost like living beings. James Urquhart takes up the story. Here in Oxford, Torsten Ryle and his team are developing a revolutionary sports video game. They're using cutting-edge technology to recreate the unpredictability of a live football match. The animated players interact with each other in real time, so you'll never see the same move twice. In the traditional way, what you'd usually have are sports games that rely on canned animations. So for example, in American football, you might have a number of tackle animations that are played back at more or less appropriate times. What we do in Backbreaker instead is that we have full simulations of our players, which means that when they tackle each other, every tackle is different. To achieve this, Ryle and his team had to develop their own technology. It combines artificial intelligence with the simulation of a character's body. Initially, they focused on getting an animated human to walk. When we started doing our experiments, we found that the initial results um, were working, but not particularly promising in terms of the realism. We found that the movements were actually very weird. So we spent a lot more time on getting the biomechanics of the body right, for example, in making the legs swing in a very natural way. Since then, the team has successfully modelled several different human movements. But they've recently managed to combine them automatically too. And what we can do is combine all of these together, either at the same time, or add them, or take them off one by one, and have essentially a system where all of these behaviours work together, ideally in perfect harmony. Animated humans can now react more naturally in complex situations. But another breakthrough will also improve the behaviour of characters who might not even be human. The big new development that we have now is that we can apply these behaviours to different skeletons, and they adapt straight away to different skeletons. That turned out to be a really, really hard research problem to get to work. Um, the reason is that it's essentially equivalent to me waking up in a child's body and being able to balance straight away and look natural. So far, the team has been focusing on character interaction. But this should change over the next few years. We'll see the technology applied to a lot more movements as well as to different types of humans and, and animals and maybe aliens. Next, we visit the home of a machine that could reduce your need to visit the shops. Tom Simonite tells us more. I'm here at the University of Bath to see a machine that could turn your desktop into a factory. So let's go and see how it works. Here in his workshop, Adrian Bowyer is setting up his invention for its daily work. It's a 3D printer that produces plastic objects from designs created on a computer. A reel of plastic is drawn into the machine, melted and squirted out into layers that are built up into the 3D shape. So if I have an idea for a new product that doesn't exist and I want to print it out on one of your machines, what do I need to do? Well, the first thing you need to do is to design it. And for that, you need a computer design program. You then read that into the program that's free again, that comes with the RepRap machine. That program works out the paths that the RepRap machine needs to follow in order to make the part that you've designed. Industrial 3D printers have been making similar objects for the past 30 years. But what sets Boya's machine apart from the others is that it can make copies of itself. Our machine is designed so that it can print out a significant fraction of its own parts. It can print about half of the parts that it, com it consists of. The next thing we want to go on to, to increase that proportion slightly, is to try to print electrical circuitry. Boya hopes machines like his will become commonplace in most households. Anyone could then download designs from the internet to print out for themselves. From a commercial perspective, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But this is an academic project, it's an open source project, and there it makes perfect sense for a person such as you to have a printer that's capable of printing a kit of parts for another printer, because then I can do the same printing that you can do. So far, Bowyer's machine is less precise than an industrial 3D printer. But with a price tag of about £300, it costs just a fraction of the price. And as improvements are made, it's sure to be well worth the investment. One of the things that we haven't done yet, but we plan to do, is to design a shredder that the machine can make so people can recycle their own milk bottles in their own home into useful objects. Um, and indeed, we made a pair of child's sandals in the machine when your child's feet grow. You shred the sandals, throw in another milk bottle, scale the design by 1.1, and you've got a new pair of sandals. Finally, thanks to some new technology, you could soon use your eyes like a joystick. Sandrine Kirstemont picks up the story. Here in Leicester, 
Steve Vickers and his team are creating a system that lets you play a video game using only your eyes. They're using infrared eye trackers to follow where a user is looking. Software then converts eye movements to control characters. You want to be able to look in the world without selecting anything. So we put the areas of interaction around this area of interest. So far, users have quickly learned the necessary eye movements. This is crucial since the technology is aimed at disabled children. But now Vickers is improving the software so it can adapt to individual abilities. Maybe makes the target a little bit bigger or maybe it will um, increase the amount of time needed to select the target. Or maybe, some, maybe we could use some other computational intelligence method to predict that's where you're looking and so um, select the button for you. Expensive eye trackers are being used to perfect the system. But a cheaper alternative is needed if it's to be widely used. Another team has just made a system for $75 using off-the-shelf equipment. We discovered that simple video gaming technology has actually the same performance as these very expensive systems. The manufacturer of these cameras actually built a lot more into them than actually was known. And we were able to discover this and reverse engineer it. The team developed software so the cameras could be used to play a simple video game. The cursor follows a person's gaze on the screen. In the left field, you see um, the infrared image of the eye. In the right field, you see how the computer processed the image of the eye to extract basically the pupil alone. Once we know where the pupil is located on that image, we can work out where the eye is looking. This is how we control the mouse cursor. So far, the system only tracks one eye. But by following the other eye as well, it could control much more than just a video game. Once we're recording both eyes, we just don't know where we're looking, but how far away we're looking. And now we have a three-dimensional user interface. This allows us then to think about applications of, for example, wheelchair control. So can we drive a wheelchair by simply looking at where we want to drive and then making the wheelchair go in that direction? That's all for now, but there are lots more videos on our website. Find out why these robots are being given away to 10 lucky researchers. Or see how some animals can be left or right-handed, just like humans. Thank you for tuning in. See you next time.